All right, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for attending my talk, Hacking Cryptocurrencies. My name is Mark Nesbitt. I'm an application security engineer at Coinbase. Um, in the blockchain village at DEF CON, you all probably know Coinbase, but for those who may be unfamiliar, Coinbase is a digital currency wallet and platform where merchants and consumers can transact with cryptocurrency. Some of my recent priorities at, at my job have been security support for systems that integrate with cryptocurrency networks, for instance, our hot wallets. And second has been security assessments and mitigations for supported digital assets. As you know, you may know, Coinbase is adding a large number of assets to the platform, and we review each and every one of them for its security qualities. I'm going to have two main sections to this talk. First, I'm going to talk about what I mean by hack when I say hacking cryptocurrencies. Second section, I'm going to talk about 51% double spending attacks. I'm going to walk through some real world examples of this. And then I'm going to talk about some observed patterns and characteristics of the attacks and the attackers that we've been able to uncover. First, what do we mean by hack? With every new technology, a new exploit vector is born. New processor developments like speculative execution or out of order execution were exciting boosts to processor speed and also enabled the famous Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities. Blockchains are no different. They represent a new technology, which means there are new ways to hack. I'll explain one of them here. Most everyone here is likely familiar with the CIA framework for security. C for confidentiality, I for integrity, and A for availability. Examining a system for these three properties can give a great start into understanding the security and threats against the system. I'll describe how 51% attacks work in a bit more detail, but for the time being, it's important to realize that a cryptocurrency is a network of nodes that communicate to one another according to a protocol. The nodes on the network store a copy of the blockchain, which is a public, shared database. And the network protocol allows nodes to communicate state information about the blockchain. Nearly every blockchain has an authorization model based on public key cryptography. The state of data in the blockchain can usually only be updated when the proper digital signature is provided. An example of this would be sending bitcoins from one person to another. The sender must authorize this state change by signing the send transaction. A wallet is an example of software that performs this action, meaning that it's built on top of the blockchain. Wallets hold private keys and can submit transactions to the blockchain. As you could realize, because a blockchain is a shared public database, anyone can choose to build a wallet application on top of a blockchain, so there are a wide variety of wallets. They have their own CIA to examine. Many of the hacks you hear about in the media are a failure of confidentiality in the parts of wallets. Peter mentioned that just a few minutes ago in his talk. Um, if the private keys are leaked, anyone can authorize transactions for actions controlled by those keys. Another interesting wallet failure mode is integrity failure. Peter also mentioned this. If an attacker can manipulate the recipient of a transaction prior to signing, there's no need for the attacker to have access to the private keys. All of this is pretty standard application security work. There's a lot of history in how to secure these types of systems. A large component of my day-to-day -day work is doing that, ensuring confidentiality and integrity in these systems. For completeness, I've given two examples of availability failure that might happen. These aren't really hacks because the attackers don't really get the funds. But this talk is not about wallets. I'm talking about hacking cryptocurrency itself, a new vector. Let's see where the CIA framework can get us there. I define the blockchain as a shared database. Thus, it's entirely transparent, and there really isn't very much confidentiality. Jumping down to availability, this is also not really going to be a focus because it's not a huge concern for anyone except for the protocol designers. This concerns matter. Concerns about the availability of blockchains have driven much of what's known as the scaling debate. If protocol design makes the resources required to run and participate in the, in the network too expensive, it may impact the availability of the information, which could have many negative impacts on the network. Violating the integrity of a blockchain is what I want to talk about. It's a way to hack a cryptocurrency. The integrity has become, recently become a bigger focus across the industry. As I mentioned before, I work for Coinbase, a major cryptocurrency exchange. Exchanges make an ideal target for all kinds of attacks, but especially 51% attacks, which I'll dive into in the second part. First off, exchanges hold a lot of cryptocurrency on behalf of their customers. That's an obvious enough reason for them to be good targets. There are other characteristics, though. For instance, liquidity and volume. Being able to trade one cryptocurrency into a different one can be very advantageous to an attacker. Speed. Exchanges often credit funds to attackers on a relatively short time frame and allow for nearly instant sends. An attack could therefore happen very quickly. Remote interaction. An attacker can execute many of these attacks from across the ocean, perhaps from North Korea. 
and in some cases, anonymity. I want to take a second to talk about this. Many popular media descriptions of cryptocurrency seem to describe it with some magical anonymity qualities, which it doesn't have. This is especially true if you have an authenticated session with an exchange such as Coinbase. Coinbase strives to be the most trusted exchange in the entire cryptocurrency industry, and as part of that, we're heavily regulated. And a large part of that regulation involves the lengths we go to ensure every customer on our platform has gone through KYC AML. KYC, know your customer, so we know their identities, and that's important for AML, anti-money laundering. Any exchange that doesn't have these strict requirements would obviously be more attractive to a potential attackers. So if you can find some sort of... If you can find some sort of vulnerability, whether that's subverting a protocol or a more traditional wallet-style vulnerability, um, as I described earlier, this makes an exchange a great target. So, 51% double spend attacks. As I mentioned before, a blockchain is a shared database stored by all nodes on the network and accessible to anyone. For this database to be useful, there must be a way to update it. Blockchains are append-only databases and are updated in batches of transactions. Each batch of transactions that's added to the blockchain is typically called a block. So you could visualize the blockchain like this with the expectation that a block n plus 1 would shortly be added. But that raises a question. Who defines block n plus 1? The database is shared and distributed, so there must be some way of coming to consensus among the network participants about what constitutes this block. The answer to this question is that it depends on the cryptocurrency. This is one of the major defining characteristics of cryptocurrencies, and a lot of new cryptocurrencies have innovative methods for adding to the blockchain. For instance, Ripple and Stellar have a concept of validator nodes that use a voting consensus protocol to determine which transactions are in this block. EOS goes through regular elections where these nodes are, known, are called block producers, and they take turns defining the block. Tezos and Cosmos, the node chosen is based on its stake, it's a proof-of-stake network, and stake is the proportion of network funds owned. Lastly, Bitcoin and Ethereum. The node that first successfully solves a cryptographic puzzle defines the block. This is known as proof-of-work. It's known as proof-of-work because the solution to the cryptographic puzzle has to be brute-forced, which takes considerable computational effort. This is called mining. Mining a block is when a node discovers the solution to the proof-of-work puzzle. Here's a key fact about proof-of-work networks. Anyone can bring their computation to the table, and if they produce a valid block, they have extended the blockchain. Since this is a distributed and permissionless way of extending the blockchain, it's possible that the network will encounter multiple versions of the blockchain. To resolve these versions and reach consensus on a single version, the network deems the version with the most work to be the canonical blockchain. I'll explain what I mean by that. This diagram shows the blockchain tilted 90 degrees with the blocks separated. Block N plus 1 will be added on top of the other blocks. As before, each block contains some number of transactions. Suppose a node, with its computational power, solves the, the cryptographic puzzle, mines a block. It broadcasts the block that solves this puzzle to the network, and all transactions in the block are added to the canonical history of transactions, that is, added to the blockchain. But suppose a second block is found simultaneously. How does the network decide which block contains the transactions that are to be added? The rule is that the nodes on the network define the series of blocks with the most work as the canonical history. So if either of the two blocks gets another block extending on top of it, there will be more accumulated work on that branch, which makes it the canonical blockchain. This means that there's never a case where a block is truly finalized on the chain. If enough work decides to extend from a different block, once that branch has outworked the rest of the chain, it will be the canonical history. The situation on this slide is called a reorg, short for reorganization, and the grayed out blocks are known as orphan blocks, and they're not part of the blockchain. Let me repeat a key fact. Any actor that can outwork the rest of the network is the sole arbiter of which among all possible valid transactions are the ones that are added to the canonical history. So if there's any kind of network instability where blocks were not always immediately shared with the network after they were found, or if some actor was deliberately holding back blocks that had been discovered, we could see something like what's shown on this slide, where the blocks on the left are hidden from the network. But if they were shared and made public, the network would switch over to these blocks and define them as the canonical chain, orphaning all the blocks that were previously the most recent additions to the chain. Because of this potential for instability of the most recent blocks, Anyone receiving a transaction should wait for several blocks to be found after the block that contained their transaction to lower the chance that the block containing their transaction will be orphaned. 
An analogy that I found interesting is that the most recent blocks are like recently fallen leaves in the fall. They can blow around and change and shift. After a while, they might get waterlogged and not move very much. And after even longer, they'll decompose into mud, clay, and eventually rock. You can adjust your risk by, adjust, by selecting the number of blocks that you wait until you consider a transaction finalized. This is known as the confirmation requirement, and each recipient of a transaction decides on their own level. So imagine we had the following situation where Coinbase supports a fictional coin, McCoin, abbreviated MUH. Suppose the confirmation requirement for MUH is three blocks. Coinbase also supports BTC, Bitcoin, and MUH trading. Any customer of Coinbase could have the following intention. Create a transaction T that sends coins from the customer's wallet to Coinbase. Wait for three blocks, after which Coinbase will consider the transaction finalized, and Coinbase will credit these funds to the, the customer's Coinbase account. Then the customer may, may want to sell the MUH for BTC, and then send the BTC wherever they like, off-site, off the platform. This is a completely normal pattern of behavior for a customer to take. Let's imagine instead, though, that the customer is actually an attacker, an attacker with a special ability to outwork the rest of the network. The attacker creates transaction T, sending some amount of MUH onto Coinbase. Suppose T is quickly included in a block by some miner on the network. Simultaneously, the attacker will create a second transaction, T prime. Notice that T prime sends the same funds that were sent in T, address at A1. And however, T prime sends those funds to address A2. T and T prime could never exist in the same blockchain together. As soon as one is included, the other would be invalid, an invalid transaction because the funds were already spent. The attacker begins to mine in secret and includes T prime in the secret block, but not T. The space on the right with the gray background is local to the attacker, and the network cannot see this block. Remember that we've assumed the attacker can outwork the rest of the network, meaning the attacker can produce blocks faster than the rest of the entire network. <laughs> so in order to do anything with the MUH on Coinbase, it first needs to have three confirmations, because that's what it takes to be credited. The attacker does not sit idly by and continues to secretly produce blocks. The network also produces blocks, but unknown to anyone, it's not keeping pace with the secret blocks produced by the attacker. Finally, the network produces the third block, three confirmations on the transaction. The attacker is now credited with the MUH and can sell it for BTC, which could then be sent off the Coinbase platform. So the BTC could be withdrawn. It's, it's, out, it's now in the attacker's control. Remember, nothing seen publicly thus far is anything out of the ordinary. But now the attacker can execute the attack. The attacker can reveal the blocks to the network. These blocks have more accumulated work than the existing top three blocks. So according to the network rules, a reorg will occur. The attacker's blocks now representing the canonical chain. The top three blocks that we've previously seen publicly now become orphan blocks. They're no longer part of the blockchain and the transactions defined in them are now no longer part of the canonical history. And notice the T was in those blocks, meaning that there's no longer a transaction to Coinbase in the blockchain anymore. But the BTC has already been withdrawn. There was a withdrawal, there was no deposit, AKA a theft. The ability to do this is directly related to how difficult it is for an attacker to overpower the network. The more work being put into solving the proof of work puzzles on the network, the more difficult it will be for any one entity to marshal the resources and overwhelm the network. Note that this, the danger of this attack comes when you accept a deposit directly from the attacking entity. In this example, BTC was provided in exchange for MUH. If the attacker can't get something irrevocable in exchange for this vulnerable coin, the attack is invaluable. This is one of the reasons that an exchange is a great target for this attack, liquidity. The thing about 51% attacks is they're pretty obvious if you know what to look for. Each block in the blockchain is identified by its hash, providing a unique fingerprint. If the hash of block at height n changes from what it was before, that block was replaced with a new block. There must have been some kind of reorg. Small reorgs, shallow depth reorgs, happen on a regular basis. This is primarily driven by the fact that many nodes across the world are attempting to find blocks. There is some amount of latency in the, in the network. So there will be race conditions where multiple blocks are found simultaneously and eventually only one will be in the blockchain. However, deeper reorgs do allow for attacks if they are, exceed the confirmation limit of the service. You can inspect a reorg to look for the presence of T and T prime. 
Two transactions are double spends if they send the same money but to different places. They can't exist in the chain together, but they might exist in competing branches of the chain. This is the smoking gun that a reorg is malicious. Money that was sent to one place is effectively clawed back when the new blocks are revealed. From the attacker's point of view, the attack has two components. One is the ability to form the secret chain, which requires majority hash power. Two, the ability to create transactions T and T prime. You're going to need some amount of the currency itself to do this, and the more coins you have, the bigger the impact of T and T prime. An attacker is also going to need to select a victim. Obviously, the victim must accept the currency, but the victim has to provide something of value that they cannot take back once they realize they've been attacked. So an attacker couldn't sell the coin for U.S. dollars and transfer the U.S. dollars to, the, to a bank account. Not only would that likely expose the attacker's identity, but the bank transfer can usually be reverted. Cryptocurrencies that aren't vulnerable to 51% attacks, however, cannot be reverted. This is another reason why cryptocurrencies exchanges make such good targets for 51% attacks. You can get cryptocurrency from them. Also notice that this attack can be repeated indefinitely until the victim takes defensive action, either by raising the confirmations required on their service or simply shutting down their interaction with this currency. We're going to walk through some real-world examples of 51% double spending attacks. The one we'll go into most detail is the 51% attack on Ethereum Classic. In early January was when this happened. And because it's an asset that Coinbase supports, we had monitoring systems in place which alerted in real time to the attack, allowing us to pause interaction with the blockchain. I'll talk about how this attack unfolded. The ETC network is minding its own business, mining blocks as usual, adding transactions to the blockchain. Then all of a sudden, seven new blocks show up out of nowhere. And these seven blocks don't extend from the most recent block, but dig down five blocks back, orphaning four blocks. 12 hours later, it happens again six new blocks or fitting five previously discovered blocks. I called both of these, trans or, uh, these, these events practice attacks. And the reason for that is because they were just reorgs. There was never a pair of transactions T and T prime where the same money was spent in one place in the first branch to a different place in the second branch. We hadn't observed reorgs of this depth ever on Ethereum Classic. And so it would have been premature to call these attacks. But once we were seeing these, we were, we were alerted that something unusual was going on. And, and three hours later, there was a very deep reorg. 74 new blocks showed up all at once, orphaning 57 blocks. And in, these, in this reorg, there was a T and T prime, where the same money was sent, spent first to one place and then to another. This was on a Saturday night. Our on-call engineers responded, validated the alert, and turned off ETC send and receive functionality. Ethereum Classic isn't the only attack, uh, isn't the only successful 51% attack. It's the one we're most familiar with because it's the one we were closest to. But I'm going to talk about two others that we've looked into closely. BTG is Bitcoin Gold and VTC is Vertcoin. But those aren't the only other two. There have been others as well. Some of the observed patterns we see from, from looking into these three different attacks. It's important to realize blockchains are public. This means that a 51% attack is a pretty noisy attack. It leaves all kinds of good data for understanding the attackers. I'm going to walk through just a few of the things that we've observed, but they really only scratch the surface of what you can learn about an attacker. These, leave, these attacks leave such a trail of damage, you could say, behind them, that I don't think it would be very long before we're very good at learning quite a bit about attackers of this, of this sort. This chart shows all 17 of the reorgs that we were able to find in our research into the Bitcoin gold attack and how much Bitcoin gold was taken in each one of them. Notice the first two didn't take anything. This is Vertcoin, VTC. The first five took nothing. And notice the first two in Ethereum Classic also took nothing. Remember what I said, the 51% attack has two parts. First, being able to build the secret chain, and then properly creating transactions TNT prime. So what did the attackers do? They broke the problem down into those two steps, made sure they could build an attack chain before they worried about building TNT Prime. Even criminals need integration tests. Criminals are also not perfect. These are the same three charts as before, all in one slide. You may have noticed that there were gaps when I first showed these to you. 
They're a little harder to explain, I think. But as far as I can tell, the attackers did a bunch of work in these cases to reorg the chain, but they didn't put in a TNT prime. So they didn't cash in on any double spending. For the first few attacks, it makes sense to assume that they're practicing. But once they've proven they can do that, these just look like mistakes to me. There's also an invest exploit decision that an attacker has to make. Imagine yourself in the attacker's shoes and you kind of have an interesting dilemma. Once you have the hash power to successfully attack the network, any additional resources you have should be directed towards owning the currency itself to amplify the impact of TNT Prime. In other words, the cost of the attack and the payoff of the attack are not functions of one another. So as an attack progresses, you're accumulating resources if you're being successful. Should you reinvest these or should you take them off the table? You know how I said blockchains are very transparent. We can observe the decisions they made clear as day. In the Bitcoin gold attack and in the vast majority of the vert coin attack, attackers are mostly in exploit mode. They have X amount of coins and every time they attack the network, they perform a double spend, they get X payoff. But in the Ethereum classic attack and oddly in these first three vert coin attacks, the attackers seem to be also in invest mode. This makes me think that the Ethereum Classic attackers may have been planning to continue attacking because I would, I would expect an optimal attack profile to include a period of invest followed by a flat period of exploit. There's also something really interesting about the Ethereum Classic data. Notice how it steps up in pairs. The first double spend was a tiny, for a tiny amount, also probably a test. You can see in, in, at, at number four and five, they're roughly the same size. But then the size roughly doubled for six and seven, almost doubled again for eight and nine, stepped up significantly for 10 and 12, with 11 looking like it may have been another mistake, and then doubled again for 13 and 15, with 14 being another possible mistake. It seems to me that the attacker was balancing, investing, and exploiting. Bigger and bigger payoffs every time, but you never know when the party is going to stop. And so you want to take money off the table while you do it. That's what this looks like to me. This is also really profitable for the attackers. You can see our estimates on how much the double spends were worth and our estimates on how much the mining cost would have been to perform these attacks. You can see the profit margins, it's, it's absurd. Our mining cost estimates were also fairly conservative. We're also not even factoring the money made from the mining reward. The attacker mined val valid blocks. Those blocks come with a mining reward, just like regular miners would have gotten. I'm not even factoring that in. They're approximately on the same order of magnitude as the mining cost, however. But the mining reward and leftover coins from the attack do typically get sold. So attackers are cashing in on this. In the case of Bitcoin Gold, it looked like about 75% of the mining rewards were moved shortly after the attack, probably to an exchange, probably to liquidate them, probably so that they could have coins that were unaffiliated with the attack. In Vertcoin and Ethereum Classic, all mining rewards were moved very shortly after the attack. Analyzing the time of, the day, time of day that the attacks happen is another route to understanding the attackers. I've mapped the times of the attacks on this slide. It's hard to draw meaningful conclusions from Bitcoin Gold and Vertcoin. There does seem to be some clustering, but it's not too dramatic, and they do have pretty much 24-hour coverage during the attack. Ethereum Classic, however, obviously has a time of day pattern in the attack. And that one outlier that you see was actually the very first practice attack. So it's, it's a different case anyway. If such a major pattern does emerge, I would consider there to be two major hypotheses about what could be driving it. The attacker's preferred waking hours or the time zone the attacker considers most damaging to the victim, probably at night. Also note that the Ethereum classic attacks and most of the Vertcoin attacks happened over weekends again, probably because that is when it is most difficult for an exchange to respond. When doing timing analysis, note that these attacks can sometimes take hours for the attacker to build the chain, meaning the attacker doesn't have the full luxury of choosing their timing and may be forced to work around the clock. As an example, the longest Bitcoin gold attack chain was 27 blocks, which probably took them over four hours to mine. The longest Vertcoin attack chain was 310 blocks, which probably took them over 12 hours to mine. As I said earlier, the risk for 51% attacks is in accepting money directly from an attacker. An attacker will want to find an exchange where it's possible to hide their identity from the exchange. In the case of Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Gold was delisted from Bittrex shortly after the attack, and the Bitcoin Gold dev team put out a statement claiming that Bit Bittrex was a victim of the attack, and that explained their delisting. I don't know who the victims were of the Vertcoin attack. 
In the case of Ethereum Classic, three exchanges all put out statements acknowledging that they were targets. KYC can help prevent an attack. Another pattern, the attacks stop after they're publicized. Cockroaches hate the light. Bitcoin Gold was a three-day attack. It was publicized on the third day. Vertcoin was nearly two months. The day it was publicized was the day of the last attack. And Ethereum Classic, also a three-day attack. The third day was the day it was publicized. The last pattern I want to talk about is also interesting. We've noticed that attackers commonly don't place their TNT prime transactions in the optimal blocks. Consider the example of the very first Ethereum Classic double spend attack that I talked about before, where 74 blocks were orphaned, or 74 blocks did the orphaning of 57 blocks. This would be the ideal block for an attacker to have placed their transaction T in. It's the deepest block that was orphaned, which would have given transaction T 57 confirmations at the time of the attack. Instead, T was placed 13 blocks higher, where it only had 44 confirmations at the time of the attack. Transaction T was not the deepest orphan block. That means the attacker did the, amount, did, did the amount of work required to orphan a transaction with 57 confirmations, but only for a transaction that had 44. This happens in the vast majority of the double spins that we've observed, which is frankly very puzzling. So let's review. I define hacking by attacking the integrity of the blockchain. New technologies, new ways to hack. I described a 51% devil spend attack, then I walked through real, war, real world examples of these attacks, along with the patterns that we've observed. That concludes my talk. Does anyone have any questions? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't quite hear you. Uh, okay, so the data of all the re-op chains, do you have a split Yeah, so um, I think, let me, let me make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. When a block is orphaned, is that data lost? Is that what you're getting at? So, so yeah, you have transactions which are rejected, and then the re-op happening, you know, one chain doesn't accept another rejection, right? So the data of the rejected blocks, two stored in the app. Yeah, the, a node will store that data on its own. So when a block is orphaned, the node in its database will say, this is an orphan block, but it'll hold it. And so you can still query your node for that data. Your node had to be around at the time because those blocks aren't being shared around on the network, but if your node saw it, your node has it. Yeah? So you mentioned that, uh, hey, I'm providing a block that doesn't lost. It's not exactly, but I think they're probably close, especially in, in um, smaller market cap coins where general purpose hardware can be moved to arbitrage uh, the mining reward. So are to go This is way more profitable. Um, if someone's gonna, if if someone is going to take a deposit for a very weak amount of confirmations and give you something incredibly valuable for it, it's just it's just so trivial to to claw back the original deposit. Um, I, I don't I don't really think they are. <laughs> Yeah, well, yes. When when they when they mine their blocks, those are just those are ordinary nodes and the easiest way for them to do it is to not even modify the software, just disconnect it from the internet, mine your block, you create your transactions and then once you you look locally, you see that you've outpaced the main chain, you just connect to the internet and then the reorg will happen by itself. How 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 is um, so Coinbase has never lost anything in this sort of attack. Um, we've only seen one attack on a chain that, or on an asset that we support, which was the Ethereum Classic attack. We we noticed it immediately because we were monitoring for this, and we immediately shut down. So the very first, there were, I can't remember the number, there were something like 15 of these reorgs with Ethereum Classic. The, the very first one that had a double spend, we alerted and we shut down. So all the subsequent ones, we were offline and they couldn't have attacked us. Yeah, but actually that, that uh, four different exchanges got targeted with the ETC 51%. Okay. And actually one of our customers was protected because the tank is empty for Got it. But really the question to you guys, or like more exchange like, if you want to withdraw that via from Coinbase, it takes five minutes, right? And literally, like, really, if I am the attacker, right, how would I cash out or move the clock so that I, I can cause a damage? I don't think that's 
Okay, for Coinbase, but under what scenario would that be? So, I'm not I'm not sure I understand your question. I think you're saying if there's a delay on withdrawing from the exchange, that makes it harder to attack the exchange. And you're definitely correct that if there is a delay in withdrawing the exchange, because then the attack could potentially be detected, and before the funds left, you could put a hold on them. But that's not true in all cases. You can transfer onto an exchange, sell, and transfer off, and that is a very common pattern. And without without these long delays. Delays are, are something, it, it's one of the pain points for a lot of customers in the cryptocurrency industry. They don't want to sit and wait for five days for seemingly no reason. So it's it's a constant balance to, to get that number right. And the, But the faster it is, the better the opportunity for an attacker. Any other questions? What's, what's that? Once the attacker transfers out of Coinbase, it's out of our control. So then if they can claw back that original on send, then they got away with it, essentially. Which has never happened to Coinbase, just to be clear. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.